soften our hearts, and Lord, that all distractions would be put aside as we hear from you. Lord, we ask you to bless this time, bless the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, well, how many are on the winning side tonight? Amen. God for that. I was a teenager, my youth pastor said it doesn't cost any more to have a good time than a bad time, so you may as well have a good time. Amen. I thought about that many times through the years. Uh, God hasn't called us to endure the Christian life. He's called us to enjoy it. Amen. And uh, we need more Christians like that, for sure. I appreciate all the music this week. Of course, we had the Merrills here on uh, Saturday and Sunday. And then we provided the music um, from that point forward. And every single one has been a blessing. Amen. Congregational singing has been a blessing. Amen. And I rejoice in that. I Listen, I go to some churches, and I wouldn't want to be sentenced to those churches. <laughs> <based on music. laughs> I mean, oh, my gracious. I went to one, and I had never been there, and I came home, and my wife said, what'd you think? I said, well, Sharon, I was there five days, and they sang every service, and I, kn I didn't know one song. I mean, not one song. Five days. And I mean, I've been at this for a long time. And I, I mean, the, you know, to, to not have a song I've never heard, it was uh, un unbelievable. Well, we've had some great times together. Great days, and I've sure appreciated it. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for being faithful. Uh, many of you have been here just every time, and I appreciate that. I know your pastor appreciates that for sure. Uh, faithfulness is such an important thing in the Christian life, amen? amen? And it is only because God is faithful to us, Amen. right? I mean, that's that's it. He's faithful to us, amen. and because he's so faithful to us, right. we reciprocate that in being faithful uh, to him for sure. And you know, I look, every time I've been down here, I've looked at all these beautiful decorations. <laughs> and I don't know who, who put that together, but that's really nice. Who did that? Is that person here? Who did that? Debbie Brower. 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 Debbie Brower on the screen. Well, <laughs> it's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. I, uh, again, you don't see that everywhere you go, so I appreciate that. And that's a way to serve the Lord. Doing things like that really matter. I appreciate that. Um, I was thinking today about how often I've been to this church through the years. And I keep a incredibly detailed listing of every sermon I preach, no matter where I preach it. In fact, every sermon I have is numbered, is categorized, and I can go to any church that I've 600 churches or more that I've preached at, and I can tell you what I preached, when I preached it, the service, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so I um, looked at the record for this church, and out of the 40 years. If you count the couples retreats that we have over in uh, Pennsylvania that I've done several times, I have, I have spoken in this church 22 out of the 40 years. Wow. Wow. That's a blessing for me. Amen. I don't know what you think about it, but I like it. That's a blessing. I mean, think about that, 22 out of 40 years. And then when I marveled at, and I'm a statistics person, so then I marveled at this sermon tonight, this sermon 100. Oh, wow. Sermon 100, 100 sermons. 
you only had to put up with five this week. But think about all these people who've been here a long time. I mean, the Haney's been here, they probably heard a hundred of them. Um, that, that's amazing to me. And so I am so grateful for the opportunity uh, to be here and have that um, relationship with your church. I pray for you regularly. Pray for your pastor. Pray for uh, your ministry here, the school, everything that you're doing. Uh, lift it up before the Lord. And uh, one of the good things, when I was a young pastor starting in ministry, I figured out that, you know, I'm not going to invite young guys. I was young, so I'm not going to invite young guys in to preach because they don't know any more than I know. I'm going to bring in the older guys that can teach me something when they come. Amen. And that helped develop me and mentor me in the ministry. And they always, you know, always um, were encouraging and helpful. And so really at the end of the day, that's what I hope this has been. I hope it's been encouragement Amen. to you in your Christian Amen. life. And just kind of charge you up and... And, um, you know, just give you a desire to serve God with a greater commitment, a greater level of faithfulness than ever before. Um, when I was talking about those sermons, one of my mottos is, you organize or you agonize. Another motto is, um, when in doubt, throw it out. <laughs> um, my wife rejects both of those. <laughs> I mean, you know how you marry your opposite so often? Well, we are off the continuum. <laughs> and so it has, been a, it has been an interesting journey for all these years. On the way over, I was telling her that several of the ladies have asked about her and said different things that were kind about her. And she said, well, you just tell them what got me through this lockdown has been prayer and chocolate. So <laughs> I thought I would share that along with you tonight. And that is indeed um, the truth. All right, take your Bible to the Gospel of Luke, if you would, tonight. Luke chapter 19. I want to read a verse that I referred to uh, earlier in this conference. Didn't spend time on it, didn't read it, I just referred to it or maybe quoted it. But I want to use it tonight as a springboard into uh, our message this evening. Luke chapter 19. And look with me at verse 10. Jesus here is speaking... And he said, for the Son of Man, by the way, that was his favorite name for himself. When Jesus referred to himself most often, of all the names, he would refer to himself as the Son of Man. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This verse comprises a 16-word mission statement of Jesus Christ. His personal mission statement. Now, to better understand and appreciate his mission, it's always helpful to understand what his mission was not. For example, his mission was not to walk on water. Now, he walked on water. When he, when he came, he walked on water, but he didn't leave heaven to come to walk on water. And, and his mission wasn't to raise the dead to life. He did that. We know that he did that. We have record of that. But that wasn't his mission. His mission was not to restore physical sight to the blind. Now, we know that he did that, and we're grateful that he did that. But he didn't leave the presence of his father to come down and simply restore sight to the blind. He, he didn't come to feed the hungry. Now, we know he did that. Well, we have records where he fed over 5,000 people at one time. And by the way, in that passage uh, about the feeding of the 5,000, we often say the feeding of the 5,000, that, that, the, the Bible actually says that there were 5,000 men. So when you add the women and you add the children, he probably was feeding somewhere between 15 and 20,000 people, yeah, that's right. without exaggeration. That's right. But again, he did that, but that wasn't his mission. He was not motivated to leave heaven, to leave the presence of his father, to do any of those things. He came for this reason, to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what we need to focus on. That's what ministry at the core is all about. However God utilizes our talents and our time and our ability for his honor and for his glory, to do anything from decorate the auditorium, to clean the auditorium, to run the PA system, to take care of the nursery, to run a children's program, to run a school, whatever it may be, fill in the blank, singing, preaching, whatever, it's all for the purpose of seeing people come to Christ. Amen. That's the mission. That's what it's all about. Jesus was all about reaching lost people. Amen. And we need to be 
about reaching lost people. Right, right. We have to be that. Without a burdened and broken heart for lost people, our Christian life is really nothing more than motion without meaning. Amen. It's activity void of spirituality. Amen. It's all talk and no walk. Amen. In fact, I would be so strong as to say that, that we become abusers of God's grace. Amen. Because we experience that grace, but he didn't shower us with grace so that we could hang on to it and hold it ourselves. He, he expressed his grace in our life so that we could share that grace Amen. with Amen. other people. And our churches have become museums for saints instead of clinics for sinners. And how tragic is that? To just be a museum for Christians instead of a clinic for lost people. So I want to take you back to chapter 10. To a very familiar portion of scripture, a familiar story, a parable. And I want us to learn tonight, or I want to remind you as I remind myself, of how to cultivate a broken heart for lost people. That, that, that's what I want to speak on. How to cultivate a broken heart for lost people. Folks, let's not be so comfortable in our Christian living that we fail to reach out to those who do not know or enjoy the God that we serve. Luke chapter 10. Now, as you're locating that passage, let me remind you of this truth. It's not what we know that will reach a city or impact a lost world. It's not what we know. It's what we're passionate about. I've used that word passion several times this week. It's what, it's what our heart is moved to do. The heart is the real person. You know, when we love God with all of our heart, by the way, that's the great commandment, amen? amen. We love God with all of our heart. That, that's not the organ that pumps blood. It's the real person, the authentic person. When I say, Sharon, I love you with all my heart, I don't mean I love you with my blood pump. <laughs> and that's not very romantic. It, it's the real person. It's who we are at, at the deepest of our core. So the heart is where passions arise. The heart is where faith is activated. The heart is where love is demonstrated. The heart is where our resources, our time, our talent, our treasure, and all the rest are directed. You've heard this said, I'm sure. People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think we need as believers to kind of elevate our care meter, to get our care meter up a little bit higher. And as I speak to you, I speak to me. I, I'm not standing here before you tonight saying I've got this mastered. The reality is I meet few people that I think have this mastered. I think in reality all of us need a, a dose of revival that will motivate us and challenge us and, and literally convict us to have that broken heart for lost people. And by the way, that's what built this church through the years. That's right. That, that, that's what got it started. That founding pastor had a burden for lost people. And he came and, and by faith started this church. And then through the years, God saved lost people. And Pastor Thompson came, Pastor Weigel came, and, 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 and we have it today. But sometimes you've got to get back and recapture that Amen. in our hearts. And how important is that? Now, Luke chapter 10, look with me at verse 30. And Jesus answering said, now, he's asked the question, in verse 26, the question at the end of this dialogue that he's having between Jesus and this attorney is this question. And who is my neighbor? That's the question. So then Jesus answered, and he gives this parable to answer that question. He said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance... There came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, set him on his own beast, 
brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinketh thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? Now by way of introduction, just let me mention a couple things real quickly. First of all, this man had a need. Amen? He had a need. Clearly he had a need. I mean, when you go up and see what, what this thief did to him, and, and stripped him, and wounded him, and left him there half dead, this guy had a need. Well, this man who was wounded is a picture of people in the world today that don't know Jesus because everybody without Jesus has a need. Everybody. Now, they may not understand their need. They not, may not realize that there's somebody who can meet that need, but they have a need for sure. So this man had a need. But secondly, he had a need that he could not meet. There was nothing he could do. Why? I mean, literally, he was half dead. People in the world today cannot meet their need because they're spiritually dead. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible talks about being dead in our trespasses and sins. So as a dead person, I can't meet my need to give me life. Someone else has to do that. And that someone is Jesus. Amen. He had a need. He had a need he could not meet. And thirdly, he had a need that others did not meet. Two religious guys come along, the priest and the Levite. Now, the Levite worked with the priests in the temple and uh, helped in many ways, and music was one of those ways. And, and these religious people come by, and in verse 31 and verse 32, they don't reach out to help him. In fact, what do they do? They see him, and they head the other direction. Now, what that tells me is this. Religion is not the answer. Religion does not meet needs. I mean, here were two religious people. I mean, a priest, a temple servant. They should have been there to help. Religion will not get it done. At all. People talk about, did you get religion? Well, you can get religion, but that's not salvation. At all. Thank God there came... A Samaritan. A man of mercy. A man of compassion. A man with a heart to help hurting lost people. You know what? All of us should be like that Samaritan. He, he's an example for us. To cultivate a broken heart for lost people. So this man, the Samaritan, when the priest didn't do it, and the Levite didn't do it, he teaches us how to do it. Let me give you three thoughts and we're done. Simple message. First of all, by personal concern. How do we, how do we reach lost people? By personal concern. Obviously, the priest and the Levite were not concerned. But the Samaritan was concerned. Personal concern. The others passed by. They didn't have a heart of compassion. They didn't care. They just walked on. And it wasn't even that they walked by him. They went out of their way to avoid him. <laughs> How tragic is that? <clears throat> I want you to notice two things about the Samaritan as we think about his concern. First of all, his vision was clear. His vision was clear. In, in verse 33, there's this expression, but a certain Samaritan as he journeyed came where he was, and when he, and notice this now, when he saw him. His vision was clear. Folks, if we're going to reach lost people, we have to see people as lost and in need of Jesus Christ. Yeah. If, if we see them as wealthy people or happy people or successful people, or whatever other word you want to use to describe them, that, that's, not going to, that's not going to motivate us. That's not going to challenge us. We have to see people without Jesus as people without Jesus. Amen. We, we, our, our vision has to be clear. And so I ask myself, as I ask you, as we encounter people every day of our life, do we have vision to reach those people? Does it matter to us that they're not saved? 
Does it bother us? Does it concern us? That, that they may die without Jesus Christ and spend eternity in hell. The question was asked in Lamentations chapter 1, verse 12. Is it nothing to you as you pass by? It's a great question. Is it nothing to you? Also in that same book, Lamentations 3 and verse 51, it says, My eye affects my heart. In other words, what we see should affect how we live, what we do. Do we see? Now, many of us have been saved for a long time. And many of us, having been saved for a long time, you know, there's a fine line between separation and isolation. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, God's called us to be separate from the world. In other words, we're not to mimic the world, we're not to love the world, we're not to be conformed to the world. So we're to be separate. There should be a distinction. In fact, the Bible calls us peculiar people. Yeah. I've met some really peculiar people. Amen. I think the most peculiar people I ever met are in church. Yeah. Not here, of course. Yeah. So separation is a biblical truth. It's a biblical doctrine. But you know what? Our separation can become isolation. We can, be some, we, can, we can become so narrow and so separate that, that we don't even have relationships. Well, we, we don't even know how to connect with people. It, 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 it just, we just kind of isolate ourselves. And I find people saying to me, good Christian people saying, well, I don't even know where to look. I'll tell you where to look. I'm going to give you five words. I hope you write them down. If you don't get anything else, get these five words. You want to know where lost people are? Number one, location. Where you live. Location. I've got some neighbors on one side of me. There is nothing other than our, our street that, you know, and, and we're breathing, we're people, that would connect us. I mean, they are totally different than us. But I am bound and determined to see them come to Christ. Amen. I mean, we're doing everything we can to build a bridge. Amen. Now, they're, they're strange. They're different. And I'm sure they're sitting home sometime talking about those kooks next door. They're really strange. So it's a two-way street. We're just, we're just living in different worlds, so to speak, even though we're right next to each other. But I'm telling you, there are people in and around us, where we live, that need Jesus Christ. It's interesting. Sometimes we will go all the way across town to witness to somebody who visits church, but we won't go next door to people we know. Location. I'm going to give you the second word. Education. Where do you go to school? I'm not just talking about students. I'm talking about, you know what, many, many adults take classes at night or they go to seminars for their job and they meet people and, and connect with people in those in, in, in educational environments. Those are all opportunities to reach out and see someone come to Jesus Christ. So we have location, we have education. Here's the next one. Vocation. Where you work. I know you have to be careful about that. I get that. But you know what? If we really manifest the fruit of the Spirit, when we're at work, whatever it may be, people are going to stand back and say, what is it that makes that person tick? How can they live that way? Is that real? Is that sincere? But if it's day after day after day where it's an authentic um, uh, life before them, at some point, the light's going to come on and say, there's something that they have, that we have, that they want. Amen. And that something is a person. Amen. Amen. So we have location, where we live. We have education, where we go to school. We have vocation, where we work. Then we have, here's the one, relation. Relation. People you live with. I wonder, just, just quick, how many of us have in our family I'm not saying just immediate family, husband, wife, kids, but our extended family, people that you know or you feel are without Christ. Amen. Look around. And if, if, if we just won 20% of those people. And then lastly, recreation, where we play. Maybe you go golfing. Maybe you go to the gym. Maybe you go to some exercise class. Who knows? I'm telling you, We've just got to get focused on reaching people. 
And we can stand back and say, well, I don't know anybody. And then here sometimes we say, but if I talk to them, that'll turn them away. They're already away. Amen. <laughs> They're already away. Yeah. That's right. So what harm can you possibly do? You're not going to drive them away. They're already away. <laughs> so his vision was clear. But the second thing I want you to see from verse 33 was this. His mission was Christ-like. His vision was clear. He saw them. But his mission was Christ-like because in verse 33 it says, and he had, when he saw them, and he had compassion on them. You know, Jude, the book of Jude talks about compassion makes the difference. We need compassion. By the way, Jesus manifested compassion, did he not? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 9, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Why? Because they were scattered. A sheep having no shepherd. And so, oh my goodness, we not only have to have the right vision, we have to have the right mission. And his mission is our mission. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what we need to be about. That's why he left heaven. And that's, a, that's what we call the Great Commission. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts, and reiterated throughout the epistles. But I think the Great Commission has become the Great Omission. We're not doing, as believers, what we ought to be doing. Personal <coughs> concern. But there's a second word. Not only by personal concern do we develop a broken heart. But secondly, by personal connection. Connection. Verse 34. And he went up to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Connection. Well, that's an important word. I was out in Lancaster speaking at West Coast Baptist College, doing some teaching on church planting, and the vice president of the school, one of the vice presidents of the school, Dr. Rasmussen, I think he's been here actually, yeah. took me and two young pastors out, we got to the restaurant, we sat down, we ordered our food, and without giving me any warning, looked to me and said, tell these two guys what they need to do to build a church. <laughs> I mean, now. Here's what I said to him, and I won't go through all of them. The first thing I said to him, you have to build relationships. If you're going to plan a church, if you're going to pastor a church, if you're going to be a, a godly Christian, if you're going to be a servant of the Lord, you have to build relationships. you got to connect to people. You can't reach people if you don't connect to people. It's like the old adage I would say to Sunday school teachers when they teach, you've got to win the child to you before you can win them to Jesus. Amen. Because in, in their little mind, that's you, you represent Jesus. And if they don't like you, they're going to like Jesus. But if we work hard to connect with people... Oh, my gracious, that opens up this door of opportunity. Folks, let's not avoid people. Let's connect with people. Amen. Let's connect. So some people see the need. They have the vision, but they don't do anything. And what I'm trying to do is challenge my heart and your heart to do something about it. To get engaged. To get involved. C.T. Studd, famous missionary from yesteryear, gave up, boy, just, just a wealthy, wealthy lifestyle. Took the inheritance that he got from a millionaire, and perhaps if we calculated in today's money, maybe a billionaire parent that gave him this money, gave it all away, with the exception of just a little portion he kept, so that when, when the day came that he got married, he could give that portion to his wife for a wedding gift. They did get married, he did give her the portion, and she said, well, you gave all of this, she took that portion, she gave that away to the cause of Christ. But he made the statement, you've heard it, only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. Amen. That's, that's, that's what I'm talking about. A connection. Now, from this verse, notice again uh, two things. First of all, he initiated the help. This Samaritan initiated the help. And I know that because in verse 34 it says, and went to him. The, the Samaritan went to this hurting person. The point is this, we can't wait for lost people to come to us. Yeah. You can't just put a sign out in front of a church building and say, you know, we meet at whatever time, come on in and we'll help you. 
The reality is some people will never come inside of a church house. Yeah. Unless, of course, we connect with them on a personal level some way. The Bible says go into all the world. Well, that starts where you live. When Jesus gave that commission in Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, he said Jerusalem first. Now, not Jerusalem only. They're, that's where they were. They were in Jerusalem. He didn't just say just Jerusalem. He said Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part. But he said you've got to begin where you are. And most of us will not go to the uttermost parts. But that doesn't give us an excuse to not go to where we are. We have to. We have to. Here's an interesting thought. You can read the New Testament from Matthew through the book of the Revelation. In fact, you can go to the Old Testament as well. But you're never going to find where lost people are commanded to go to church. It's not in the Bible. Now, we're told to come. We're told to gather. In fact, he said, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together, as a matter of some is. In other words, we need to be gathered. And, 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 and that's helpful for many reasons, on many levels. But lost people are not commanded to come to church. The church is commanded to go to lost people. And so we got to kind of get that reversed. We almost have the mindset, well, if they're really, really hurting and they're really, really needy and they're really, really hungry for the gospel and they really, really want to get saved, they'll come. Well, the truth is they don't come. Not in any marginable way. Not in any measurable way. We have to go there. So he initiated the help, but then the second thing is he inconvenienced himself. Look at verse 34. He took this, this hurting man and set him on his own beast. Not the man's beast, but, but the, uh, the Samaritan's beast. In other words, he did without, so the hurting guy didn't have to. That was an inconvenience. More than likely, the Samaritan walked alongside of his own beast because the hurting guy was on his beast. He inconvenienced himself. And I suggest to you that there is an element of sacrifice in reaching people with the gospel. Amen. It, there's an element of sacrifice. It demands that we be inconvenienced for the cause of Christ. Amen. Which leads me to the third thought. Connection, yes, but also commitment. By personal commitment. Concern, of course. Connection, of course. But now we come down to commitment. Look at verse 35. <laughs> and on the morrow, when he, the Samaritan, when he departed, he took out two pence, gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again, I will repay. Again, notice quickly with me two thoughts regarding this man's commitment. First of all, he paid the cost. The Bible says in verse 35, he took out two pence. Now you might look at that and think, well, that's not a lot of money. That's not a big sacrifice. I mean, that's not a big commitment. That's not, you know, he didn't invest much. No, two pence was about two days income for a normal worker. Now, can you imagine meeting someone that you've never met and hand over 40% of your paycheck to a person you've never met? Just to help them. I, I, I can't speak for anybody here, but I, I wonder, is there anybody who's ever done that? This guy did. That, that's a commitment. In other words, he, he was invested in helping this man. It wasn't just, I'll give him this gospel track and hope for the best. I mean, he met his needs in a tangible way. You know, when you think about paying the cost, sometimes it's money. I get that. But I think more than that, it's time. Willingness to put in time. It may be time to pray for that person. Just time. What about, you know, sometimes it's creativity. Where we, we stand back and as an individual, as a church family, you get creative. How, how, can, we, how can we make a dent in this world? 
How can, how can this city be impacted with the gospel? Amen. You know, this, these days are changing. I, Pastor and I have had some conversations this week. I, I don't think, we're, listen, when COVID's over, we're not going to go back exactly the way we were before COVID. Amen. We're going to have to reinvent how we do things in many ways. Because like it or not, understand it or not, COVID has changed the psyche of our country. And we've got to really get creative about how we reach people. We have to. Flexibility. There's just all kinds of words that talk about the cost that we have to pay. You know, sometimes it's giving visitors the very best seats. Now, you might think the very best seats are up front. But I don't think you think that because there's very few people up front. <laughs> Best seats are you know, like um, seventy percent of the congregation sits back there. <laughs> well, I pastored a downtown church in St. Paul, Minnesota, and we had a precious lady, elderly lady. She had her seat, and they were all individual seats, all individual. Main floor, balcony, had a second balcony, all individual seats. And she came in one day, had her cane, and bless their heart, this young couple sat in. Her seat. And she took the cane and drove them, drove them out. They were visitors. That was their first Sunday. Drove them out. So the, the head usher was aghast. He came to me and said, Preacher, you don't know what. It was Ruth. You know what Ruth did. Oh, my gracious. Well, we always visited visitors, so I gave that one to the system pastor. I said, you take this one. You go see this young couple, and if you survive, I'll go back. Are you kidding me? Thankfully, they were believers. And so, it, it, you know, it was strange, but it didn't offend them. It didn't stop them. They ended up joining the church, and he became a deacon at some point, so I was grateful. But, you know, what an entrance into a church. You know, we take the best parking spots or, or whatever. Folks, we just got to retool our thought process. We just do. And, you know, sometimes we talk to all the people we know, but we don't really communicate with the people that come in that are strange and wondering and questioning. And, you know, you, you realize there's a lot of people that have never stepped foot in a Baptist church. And that's a strange thing to them. I was trying to win a Catholic lady to Christ. And uh, she said to me, she said, well, I'll go to your church. On one condition. I said, what is it? She said, you go to my Catholic church. I said, no problem. Really? I'll go. Yeah. I'll go. Now, I knew whatever they did there wasn't going to affect me. Right. Right. I went. It was a Saturday night deal. Now, I, I, listen, I don't know what they did when they got there. I mean, they were blowing smoke and bending and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> I mean, it was awful words I didn't understand. So, you know, I just kind of sat there marveled at it, to be honest with you. But here was the point. It, it dawned on me. How I felt in that Catholic church is how many people who are unchurched, unsaved, feel when they come into our churches for the first time. What is this? The songs you sing? They've never sung those songs. You know, angels, prostrate, fall, what's that? A medical thing? I mean, they, they have no idea what we're saying or doing. And we wonder why they don't come back. They run for the hills. We gotta pay the price. Whatever that price may be. You know, by the way, the gospel's free, but not without cost. And Jesus went to the cross. Yeah. That's the ultimate cost. Amen. Missionaries go to the field. You see them up on the wall. That's a cost. And giving is a cost. Praying is a cost. So he paid the cost, but the second thing I see, the second thing I see is this, when we think about commitment, is he made a long-term commitment. Because in verse 35 it says, Whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I'll repay thee. In other words, he invested in the man right then. But he was willing to invest in that same man later. Amen. Now let me tell you what, and I'm, I'm a Baptist. Someone said, what would you be if you weren't a Baptist? I said, I'd be ashamed. I mean, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> so I want you to understand that context. I'm happy to be a Baptist. There's a reason I am. 
There's a conviction. But a lot of people aren't baptized when they get to heaven. Of course, we know that. It's not joining a church. It's not even the Baptist way. It's Jesus. We can Amen. 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 I understand. Right. But when we when we get so focused on on the denominational label, and I am. But but other people don't always understand that. And so we have to be willing to be patient and helpful. But one mistake that I think we've made, or one thing we've overlooked historically as Baptists, is by and large in our movement we've done a pretty good job of evangelizing. Amen. I think we've done a despicable job at discipling okay. as a whole. I mean, we've reached people. But are we keeping people? And I'm not, I'm not hammering your church. I'm hammering our movement. I'm hammering Baptists. I'm one. I pastor. I mean, that's, that's an issue. Folks, it's not win them, wet them, and lose them. That's not a strategy. That's not a strategy to build this church. You win them, you wet them, and out the door they go. No, it takes a long-term commitment. I, um, I was pastoring a young guy, I mean, trying to figure it out. And, man, we were winning people. But we were winning people. But we weren't doing anything with them. Only one of them. Easy come, easy go. And it burdened my heart. And I sat down and God gave me Scripture, and, 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 and the thing I marveled at was the phrase that, that people were with Jesus. They were with him. And I realized that their training was because they hung around Jesus. Amen. And what I thought is, we've got to get these new converts to hang around us. We've got to hang around them. Yeah. They need to see it, not just hear it. Amen. And so I sat down and wrote a, a discipleship course called What's Next? You're saved. What's Next? Eight lessons. And our theory was to get into the home. Don't do it at church. Get into their home. I want to get into their home. Why? I want to see what's going on in that home. Amen. Thank Amen. You, Number one. Number two, uh, we might win the man or the wife or whomever, but we want, I, want to, I want to win the whole, the whole family. Right. So I'm going to get in there. And thirdly, because they're like baby Christians, and you don't put the burden on the baby. Yeah. If you say, hey, we're going to disciple you on Wednesday night, come to church, guess what? If it's as cold as it is out there tonight, they probably won't show up. That's right. If it's raining or snowing, they're not going to show up. You don't put the burden on the baby. You don't take the baby into the, into the, you know, to the, from the hospital and plop up in the crib and say, now, if you're hungry, come on out here in the living room. <laughs> you know, we'll feed you. Or go to the kitchen. Thank you. No, the burden's on the parent. Thank you. So if we birth them, that is, if we lead them to Jesus, we need to parent them. We need to keep the, 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 the fruit that remains is what John uh, 15 and verse 16 is all about. So there has to be a long-term commitment. So when we see someone come to Jesus, boy, we've got to work really hard to build them up in the faith and encourage them and teach them the word of God. And that, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That strength, that stability, that encouragement. It's amazing. You know, when I pastored in St. Paul, Minnesota, and when we finally got this kind of in, in effect, and I taught our people, and we all got on the same page, we were keeping 80 to 85% of our adult converts. They were staying. And I promise you, prior to that, it probably was 20 or 25%. But we had a strategy of how to do that. And folks, it takes all of us to do that. It's everything for assimilating them, and being friendly to them, and answering their questions, and smiling. You know, assimilation, people can join the church. Church membership is easier than assimilating. Assimilating is when they're absorbed into the church. I mean, they have a sense of belonging. When, when people joined our church, I, I had what we call the 90-day visit. So once they joined 90 days later, we went to their home. How, how, how are you doing? You making friends? You feel comfortable? You got any questions? I felt like most people would hang in for about three months. But what I discovered is... After that, they begin dropping away if we're not really ministering to them and helping them. And so, again, putting all that together, well, who does that? It takes people to do it. That can't just be a pastor's job. Yeah, that's right. 
It's got to be everybody's job. And some people are, are really gifted soul winners. I mean, listen, they can, they can just witness and it flows and it comes. And other people aren't necessarily that gifted. But in that area, but boy, they can sit down and teach the Bible to somebody. Figure out what you're gifted to do. Figure out where, where God has blessed you. And, and it is, it's like music. You know, I hear people sing and I marvel at that. It's not mine at all. But thank God it's there. It's in the church. And so we have to figure all of that out. And commitment is a part of it. It's not just seeing people come to Christ. It's seeing them grow in the faith. And become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Amen. So he invested in the man, not just then, but after that. So when you take the wounded guy out of the picture, there's really three actors. You got the thief, you got the two Jews, and you got the Samaritan. The two religious guys. So the thief said, what's yours is mine, I'll take it. That was his motto. The two religious guys said, what's mine is mine, I'll keep it. But the Samaritan had it right. He said, what's mine is yours. We'll share it. God, to whom much is given, much is required. If God has saved your soul, it's incumbent upon you, as it is upon me, to share what he's given to us. Amen. We have to. And that is such an important truth. So let me give you the application of the story. Verse 37. And he said, the man that asked the question in verse 29, and he said, he that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, and here's our application, go and do thou likewise. What that Samaritan did is what you and I need to do. And if we do that, if, if Ocean County Baptist Church really gets revived and really gets revved up and really gets excited about reaching people and discipling people, oh my gracious, are you kidding me? Your greatest days can be ahead. Amen. That, that, that min doesn't minimize the past at all. You've had phenomenal 40 years. But you can have a phenomenal future. But it all comes down to having a heart for lost people. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. You know, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. and Boy, I just pray that God has touched some hearts tonight. I wonder tonight, do you have a broken heart for lost people? Does it, does it matter to you that there are people in this community dying without Jesus? In your neighborhood? Your relations? Your location? Your recreation? All of those areas we talked about? I wonder how many of you say, Preacher, God has spoken to my heart. And as you were preaching, I thought of somebody tonight. I thought of a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, somebody. You, God just brought into my heart, into my mind. That lady, that man, that friend, that teenager. And, and I wish you would pray with me as I pray for them. Just slip your hand up tonight. Do you have a broken heart for somebody? Oh, my gracious. So many. In a moment, we're going to stand, and I'm just going to ask him to play. And, and, and I'm going to pray, and after that, he'll play. Why don't you come and just pray for that lost person? Why don't you ask God to just break your heart for that lost person? Not just that person, but anyone that you can reach with for the cause of Christ. Amen. Oh, would you do it tonight? Let's stand. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Dear God, tonight, we don't want to be like the religious guys. We sure don't want to be like the thief. We want to be like that Samaritan. We want to be like him. He had concern. He had connection. He had made a commitment. May that be us. Lord, tonight, hands all through this building were lifted, saying, yes, God put somebody on my heart, a neighbor, a loved one, a co-worker, somebody at the gym, somebody on the golf course, somebody at, at school. He, he put that person on my heart, Lord, and tonight I'm going to come and I'm going to ask you to give me the boldness and the wisdom and the ability and, 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 and just the, uh, the the faith to be able to communicate the gospel and live that gospel out before their eyes and, and pray that they'll come to Jesus. Amen. Oh, Lord, that would be such a wonderful thing. Lord God, I pray. Oh, I pray for the folks tonight. Work in our hearts. Our heads are bowed as he plays. Would you come tonight? Bring that person before this altar tonight. You lifted your hand, your burden for them, you're concerned about them. Don't come for me. Don't come for the preacher. Come because God has touched your heart 
about that person or people generally that you're concerned about. Oh, just take it before the Lord. Thank you. 